What's up, as they say. You guys are all from Parlier, yes? Okay. Super late. All right, so you're just in time for us to start the lecture on uh, aircraft history. So we're still on 03A, decade before World War One, and but this is part two. So I don't care if you like part two, but the quiz at the end might say these are out of part one, these are out of part two, these are out of part three. So I would recommend you write part two. I put this next line on their essays to remind me for us to look at the syllabus. So if you would pull out the syllabus for 102, for 102, of course yours doesn't have red letters on it, but it's got a schedule that looks like this spreadsheet and it says 102 on it. If anybody can't find theirs or you think you've lost it, let me see me after class. I'm sure I have an extra one in my office. You'll notice I had you write in that the draft was due, and I delayed it till Monday. And right now, according to this, it says the SA Research Project is due this Thursday, and I want to change that to uh, the 5th of September. Now, you can if you've been working on it and you think you want to turn it in on Thursday, you're welcome to do it. But officially, we're moving the due date of SA-1. It is no longer Thursday, 31 August. It is due 5 September. That's Tuesday. Now, be careful. For some people, they forget about things on a three-day weekend, and then they show up and say, oh, darn, I forgot to bring it with me. So, I'm, so if you want to turn it in on Thursday this week, that would be fine. If you want to turn it in on Friday, I would be happy to accept it early. But since I delayed turning in the draft until Monday this week, and I want to talk some more about it tomorrow about because I want everybody to get a really good grade on that essay. So does anybody have any questions about the change in due date for essay number one? It's also the research project. And Jordan, you didn't happen to bring paperwork with you today? Okay, please do not leave. You can give it to me now. Please do not leave without giving me that paperwork. Otherwise, Valley ROP said they will pull out their non-lethal weapons. And, and, okay, you got that blue piece of paper? Do you know the name of that counselor? Well, you say it should be fine, but Valley ROP is going to say, where's the blue sheet? And I'm going to say the student gave it to somebody, and he doesn't know who. What's that person's name? I.G.? Okay, I got his email. He's from Parler, right? Okay. All right. Thanks, Jordan. All right. So I, tomorrow we'll probably spend the first five or eight minutes of class going over exactly what I want about that essay because I want everybody to get a really good score because just for fun, can anybody look through that syllabus right now and tell me all the three essays added together are worth how much of your grade? No, I want somebody to tell me they know what it is. I don't want to guess. Look in your syllabus right now. You have it in front of you. What? You're sure? So each one is worth 10% of your grade. Because there's three of them, and combined they're worth 30%. I have to do it that way. The college says i got to have pre I got to have, oh, wait. Does it say research projects? How much are the research projects? Another 30. Half an essay of your research. Here's where I want you to. Here's where I want you to lose control of your bodily functions. Sixty percent of your grade are these three essays, because half of the essay is going to be graded on the research that you did. Unless you want separate research projects, who wants separate research projects in addition to the essays? Go ahead and remain seated. Oh, okay, fine. I'm just, all right, just kidding, just kidding. Thank you. I saw, I saw you move. I saw you move. All right, so. I want to be, so that's why I want to go over it really strongly tomorrow. 
So let's just so so again, I want to make sure you're clear here. The SA and the research project are all rolled into one, or actually there's three of them. And so that one essay, you, now you've done 20% of this first essay. But this whole essay, the draft and the finished product, that's worth 10% of your grade for the essay, and it's also worth another 10% for your research. So that's now 20% of your grade, and we're going to do three of these. So tell me how important it is for you to do well on this essay if you want to even get a passing grade in this class. Think about that. So is it okay if I don't make it due on Thursday? Is it okay if it's due on Tuesday, the day after? Okay. Here's a really great idea. It's in the syllabus. You don't have to look it up. Okay. An email or hand me a hard copy, and I would be happy to look it over in advance and tell you what I think and to give you ideas on way to make it better. You could email me something tonight and say, Here, Mr. Johnson, here's my draft of my paper. Did I do? Am I doing it the way you want? And I'll and I'll what I'll do is I'll probably print it out and then write on it in in red ink with you know with volunteer student blood. Did I tell you about that? Okay, all right. I'll write on it in red ink and I'll hand it back to you because it's hard to make comments typing on it. But remember, if you hand it to me in class, I won't be able to give it to you until the next day. So if you gave it to me right now, I'm not going to look at it today. I'll look at it this evening. Or I'll look at it tomorrow morning, and I'll give it back to you the next day. So if you really, 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 really want to do that, that means you need to hand it to me by Thursday. So I can give it to you on Friday, and you can do make the corrections over the weekend and give me the final product on Tuesday. So just for fun, if you don't have an excuse, well, if, you're, if you don't have an excused absence for Tuesday, and you show up on Tuesday, which will be a normal day, and you don't bring it with you, does anybody know what happens? Half credit. And how long do you get to turn it in and still get half credit? Seven, seven working days or seven calendar days? It's calendar days. So I'm, I'm not trying to hose you over here. I'm just warning you. This is the way it's set up. This is the way it's going to work. Any questions so far? All right. So we're still talking about that decade before World War I. World War I started in what year and ended in what year? 1914 to 1917. Man, how many times have I said brought that up in class? More than once? What does that mean when the instructor has said it more than once? What? It's important. And what does it mean when it's important? It means the likelihood of it being on the test is greater than the other things that he only said once. But you probably already knew that. All right. Tell you what, I don't want you to write all these details down, okay? Don't do that. What I want you to get out of the fact that is, number one, just write down newspaper competitions. What I want you to understand is, in that decade before the war, flying was ridiculously exciting. It was, it was more exciting then than space is now. Think about space in the 1960s when we were launching Mercury. One person, Gemini, with two people. The Soviets were launching Soyuz's. And then we ended up launching a three-person job, uh, the Apollo missions in 1960. The, the country of the United States was riveted. Literally, my parents bought it. Their, we had a black and white TV. In 1969, and it wasn't because they were landing on the moon, my parents bought a brand new color TV. It was a 19-inch diagonal screen. It was awesome, man. It was huge. Big sticking out of it. Man, it was great. It's great because Saturday mornings we get up, my folks were on the other end of the house, we get our Captain Crunch and go sit in front of the TV because they didn't have remote control, so we, had, so we had to be sit close enough that we could turn the channel, clunk, 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 and then you had to fine tune it. And then you could have a couple of bites of Captain Crunch, go, oh, I don't like that cartoon, and go clunk, clunk to the next channel. Have a, okay, well, that's what I did. You know, I, I did this for about two hours, about two or three bowls of Captain Crunch. Then I had a sugar buzz, so then I'd go outside the rest of the day, ride my bike, and throw dirt clods at the neighborhood kids who were three years younger than me. And I could throw farther than them, so they could throw back and not hit me. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, I played appropriate simulated war games with the younger children in my neighborhood. Yeah, that's what I did, and I always won. In any case, in in the ten years before World War One, flying machines were like mackerel. See, I'm not saying naughty words here. It was way more holy mackerel. 
So this was what sold newspapers. Remember, this was before TV, before the Internet, before the radio. People weren't listening to radios in the United States between 1903 and 1914. Radios didn't get really popular in the United States until the 20s, and then really, really popular into the 30s. So what did people do? They read newspapers. And companies that had newspapers made money selling newspapers. So the newspapers wanted to sell more. So if they sponsored a race and said, we'll give $10,000 or $50,000 or whatever for the winner of this race, it was exciting because then they could write newspaper articles for a month leading up to the race and take pictures, and they sell a lot of papers because everybody thought it was exciting. So this was a boon. This, was, uh, in a, this made people building airplanes build more faster, fly higher, fly longer airplanes because they wanted to win the prize and then take the money and turn around and build bigger airplanes. So I'm not worried that you know the fact of when there was newspaper races and how fast they were going, but this had an impact on people designing faster airplanes, airplanes that would fly farther, airplanes that would fly higher. The thing I want you to know about the Wright brothers' patent fights is not the fact that it was about the Redder versus the Aileron and blah, 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 but the fact that the Wright brothers were in court fighting Glenn Curtis, saying that Glenn Curtis had infringed on the Wright brothers' patents. And this really slowed them down, the Wright brothers in particular, on building better airplanes because they had to spend time and money play in court instead of staying in their shop and designing and building better airplanes. So that first line there about the wing warping and rudder, don't worry about that. I just want you to understand that the Wright brothers were suing Curtis, and it messed things up for both sides. And then the second thing that I'd like you to know off this slide is that the, the patent rights in Europe are a lot less restrictive, and so it was legal it was harder for the rights to, to sue people in Europe. Remember a slide, I think it was a couple of slides ago, all, two-thirds of the airplanes that flew before World War I in, in Europe, what did they look like? The Wright brothers. But they weren't doing it illegally. Oh, and for those people that got late, I know it was the bus, so I'm not sweating it. Uh, you did miss the lecture from the previous class, but what I did was pass out a piece of paper, and we went out in the lab and, and went around taking notes around the airplanes, and so I was not able to record it. So you won't be able to go home and record it. So I'm going to, we're not going to have a quiz tomorrow in 101. That will give you a chance to, uh, for me to figure out how you can c catch up on your notes that you missed from 101. All right. Anybody need any more time on this? Okay, keep going, Jordan. Right, legibly, you're going to have to read this when you're falling asleep at night at the end of the semester studying for the final exam. Oh, wait, this class only goes halfway through the semester. Halfway through the semester, history will be over. Private pilot ground school is going to go all semester. But halfway through the semester, it's in the middle of October, this class will be over, and then we'll start careers in aviation. Johnny. I'm sorry? Can you throw your gum away? Yes, you may throw your gum away. My request is take some blank paper next time so you don't have to get up in the middle of class. So I want to talk about briefly about engines before World War I. So you can write this down, and I'm going to show you a list, and I'm going to show you some pictures, but I'm not going to ask you, name eight of the different seven engine manufacturers that were in, in making airplanes before World War I, okay? I'm not going to ask you the name of any of the engine manufacturers, okay? All I want you to get out of this slide is the fact that not only were there lots of different airplane manufacturers that were, that were building new airplanes, in that 10 years before World War I, there were also a lot of engine manufacturers. What I find really interesting, you don't have to write this down, but if you, look at, if you buy a Chevy, who made the engine in that car? General Motors. Well, General Motors makes Chevy, right? Okay. If you buy a Ford, 
who made the engine for that Ford. Ford. Now, there's a few exceptions. You can get some big, giant diesel pickup truck that has a Cummins diesel engine in it. But by and large, the vast majority, if you buy a Honda car, who made the engine? Honda. Okay. In the aviation world, in airplanes and helicopters, that is pretty much never the case. You buy a Cessna airplane, it has a Lycoming engine or a Continental engine. You buy a Piper airplane, it has a Lycoming or a Continental. You buy a helicopter, it probably has a Lycoming or Continental. There's only two engine manufacturers in the United States that make piston engines. There's one in Canada called Rotax. So you got like three choices of who you want to buy your engines from if you make airframes. But the airframe manufacturers in the United States don't make the engines. But so. Don't write these down, but the Gnome engine, look at that, 150, 165, horses, uh, 165 pounds, so that's 35 pounds less than the Wright brothers, but instead of 12, it's 50 horsepower. So this is like four or five times better, and look, 1907, that's only four years later, and this thing has a ratio of horsepower to weight that's four times better, not twice as good, not three times, four times as good, and here's a picture of it. There was a lot of fighters in World War I that used a, ver a, a, a bigger version of this engine. And Zani was in Italy. Look, there's three cylinders. The Antoinette was made in France. This, they put it on an airplane that looks like a boat. But it's hard to notice, but there's actually four cylinders on each side. This is a V8, and it's water-cooled. Mercedes, look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six, a straight six. Mercedes made airplane engines. They also made them. They, they were. They made airplane engines in World War One. They made airplane engines in World War Two. Rolls Royce also did, but as far as I know, they hadn't kicked into making airplane engines yet. I'd have to. I'd have to do some research to look around and find when. To, I was looking at the big manufacturers. I'm not saying Rolls Royce didn't make an airplane engine before World War One, but they weren't one of the bigger manufacturers. They became one of the bigger manufacturers. That's for sure. So here's a one, two, three, four, five, six. Here's a straight six by Benz. Hmm, Mercedes, look at that. Mercedes and Benz. Two different companies. Hmm. Mercedes and Benz. Turned into Mercedes Benz and then anybody ever heard of Daimler? Daimler Mercedes Benz. Now the, all three of those companies are just one big company. And they make cars. And they make engines for their cars. So here's a big straight six Daimler engine. You don't have to draw these. I'm not going to ask you how many cylinders are on them or anything. Curtis, I knew some guy named Curtis. His name was Glenn, right? He got sued by the Wright brothers. Look at it, V8. Er, 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 er. So I'm not going to. Oh, and the Wright brothers also made engines. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here's a straight six cylinder. So pretty much all of these were either straight sixes or V8s. And if you look at big engined cars. A decade after this, in the 20s, all the big cars had straight six, or they had V8s. And to this day, V8s and straight sixes, although usually when they go to straight sixes, they just go to four. But All right, so what do I want you to know about this slide is that pretty much the same thing as the previous slide. There was a lot of companies making brand new engines to, specifically for airplanes during that decade before World War I, and not just in Europe, also in the United States. All right, flight schools. If you bought an airplane from the Wright brothers or the Curtis Company or from somebody in Europe, they'd give, they'd give free flying lessons to one person. But remember, pilot certificates, you didn't even have to have them. Nobody even issued a pilot certificate in the United States. Well, the federal government didn't. The aero clubs had the first pilot certificates. When did the United States first issue pilot certificates? I know it was yesterday. 1927. Ten years after World War I was over. So you just flew till the your flight instructor said, yeah, you're fine, and away you went. It's like driving a bicycle. Your mom, your dad, your grandmother teach you how to drive a bicycle. Yeah, you're good enough. Okay, don't get, don't drive in the street. I'm going back inside and have my lemonade. 
There was way more flying training in Europe than there was in the United States. Way more in Europe than in the United States. Pretty much in the U.S. it was the Curtis and the Wright brothers. But in Europe there was way more than just two aircraft manufacturers. And remember, balloons had been going on in Europe for a long, long time, and there was a lot more balloons and dirigibles in Europe than there ever were in the United States. So aviation was a lot bigger in Europe than it was in the United States, so therefore there was more flight training in Europe than there was in the United States. And guess where? I should have asked you that question. Guess if you had to pick one country, if you had to pick one country in Europe, where you th yeah, thanks for laughing, I appreciate that. If you had to pick one country in Europe and said, hmm, I wonder where most of the flight training was going on, by now it's probably pretty obvious. So that's like a great answer. If I ask you any question about blah, 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 the biggest in, in, at this time, where was that occurring? If you don't write France down, then something's wrong. You know, unless, you, unless I'm talking about the Wright brothers, then you're going to go, okay, fine. Where did the Montgolfier brothers? Where was the first dirigible flown? Where was the first airplane in Europe flown? Yeah, all, the, yeah, all that stuff is doing hanging on in France. All right. I want to talk about the military aviation before World War I. And that's, when I say WWI, that I is Roman numeral one. If you'd write, rather write the letter one, the correction, the number one, that's fine. You don't have to write Roman numeral one. I'm just used to doing it that way, but you can write WW1 if you want. All right, not a lot of airplanes in the United States military. The United States military hadn't really decided that it was going to do very much other than just being a scout or flying messages from one place to another. They actually put the airplanes in the signal corps of the Army. The signal corps, they had the telegraphs. And they were the ones that you wrote a message and stuck it in a leather pouch and handed it to somebody and they jumped on a horse and rode on a horse and took a message somewhere else. That was the signal corps. So that's where the airplanes were in the United States Army. And which, which country do you think had more military airplanes than any other country? Yeah, before World War I, the French military had more airplanes in the, US, in the military than any other country. So if you, had to, if you had to go back in time and you wanted to be a pilot, you need to take French lessons, I'm telling you. Don't worry, it's a Latin-based language, right? Just remember, most of the T's are silent. I don't know. I, I, don't, I, I can't give you any other advice on speaking French. Sorry, I got it as loud as it'll go. Six minutes and 40 seconds. So right Frank Lahm was the very first soldier to fly in an aircraft, and his flight marks the beginning of fixed wing military aviation. In October 1909, Frank Lahm of the U.S. Army Signal Corps was taught to fly by the Wrights and became okay. one of the first two yeah, pilots in the, the U.S. Army. Such was the general public's growing fascination with flight that by now. So literally, these are replicas that people have built in, you know, in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years of airplanes that were designed and flown a hundred years ago. Look, check it out. Now they got different hats. They got these straw hats going on now. What happened to those little floppy hat things? If you type in, I think that's enough. If you type in uh, BBC, the Century of Flight, on YouTube. Look at that, one out of 26. I think they have 26 different videos on YouTube, and you can pick which one you want. So if you got if some, if if you got this hankering to learn more about aviation history, and you'd rather watch black and white videos of the old school days flying instead of listening to me talk, then you're very welcome to go to YouTube, because there's a boatload of videos. All right. 
sweet. That was all combined. Wow, you know what that means? The next thing we're going to do is going to be World War I. And I didn't bring it with me to class. So, this is what I want to do. If you were here...